Once saved, always saved, flies in the face of the constant teaching of the Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation's end. The major evangelical voices are saying, you're saved by grace alone. It doesn't really matter how you live after you're saved. You're saved. I grew up in an assembly which uh, taught that, that I've accepted Christ and now I'm guaranteed for all eternity. And the danger of that is that you tend to relax. Once saved, always saved makes the wide way acceptable. We're Christianizing the wide way. We have cut the whole idea of transformed living. We've cut it off at the knees. I believe it's a lot of the explanation of the hypocrisy in the American church and much of the church around the world today because there's a lot of people that are living like hypocrites because they've been taught that they don't have to live holy lives. I mean, we're talking about heaven and hell. We're talking about uh, eternal life. It's not over till it's over. No Christian life should be judged in advance of death. Believers in once saved, always saved, invariably take the high ground historically as though they're defending the historic faith. This is incredibly dishonest. That's because before Augustine's novel teachings in the early fifth century, absolutely no one in the early church believed in once saved, always saved. I know of no patristic scholar or church historian who disputes that fact. The patristic fathers did not believe in once saved, always saved. They believed there was a possibility of turning from Christ. And so they would have a position much like modern Arminians on the possibility of apostasy. There wasn't some kind of airtight guarantee of salvation, regardless of your belief or behavior. Those are the days when people were being martyred for the sake of their faith. They wouldn't deny Christ. I mean, they only had to say one word and they, they wouldn't be killed. But they wouldn't do it. They were so faithful. And such people understand the doctrine much clearer than we who live in such comfort today. The first generation of Christians after the apostles were in a unique position to make a bold statement that no generation of Christians ever since has been able to make. This is the faith that was handed to us by the apostles. In fact, the first generation of these Christians were personally discipled by the apostles, men like Clement of Rome, Ignatius, and Polycarp. They had inherited a Bible that taught people to believe, to obey. They knew no other way in the early church than faithfulness over the long haul. The early church fathers actually warned against the idea of, of once saved, always saved, because that doctrine was found not within any Christian churches at the time. It was found among the Gnostics. The Gnostics were heretics who denied that the God of the Old Testament is the same God as the God of the New Testament. They also believed that our flesh was inherently corrupt. Furthermore, they denied that Jesus had come in the flesh. And John refers to them in 1 John 4, verse 3, as the Antichrist. And in their refutations of the Gnostics, uh, they, would, they would mention how these Gnostics believed that you could never fall away from the faith, that you were uh, essentially eternally secure. Origen wrote about one group of Gnostics. He said, quote, They essentially destroy free will by introducing ruined natures incapable of salvation and by introducing others as being saved in such a way that they cannot be lost. Irene states, but as to themselves, speaking of the Gnostics, they hold that they shall be entirely and undoubtedly saved, not by means of conduct, but because they are spiritual by nature. It is impossible that spiritual substance by which they mean themselves should ever come under the power of corruption. Wherefore also it comes to pass that the most perfect among them addict themselves without fear to all kinds of forbidden deeds of which the scriptures assure us that they who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. They run us down, that is the true Christians, who from the fear of God guard against sinning even in thought or word as utterly contemptible. Cyprian said, you are still in the world. You are still in the battlefield. You daily fight for your lives. So you must be careful that what you have begun to be with such a blessed commencement will be consummated in you. 
It is a small thing to have first received something. It is a greater thing to be able to keep what you have attained. Faith itself and the saving birth do not make alive by merely being received. Rather, they must be preserved. Justin Martyr, I hold further that those of you who have confessed and known this man to be Christ, yet who have gone back for some reason to the legal dispensation and have denied that this man is Christ and have not repented before death, you will by no means be saved. By the beginning of the 5th century, Augustine, who was the Bishop of Hippo, laid the foundation for the modern doctrine of once saved, always saved. You get then to Augustine, Augustine of Hippo, who starts off like the fathers that came before him, and then he evolves into something much more akin to what we would call Calvinism today. Augustine is the big um, transition figure, no question. Early on, he was not someone who affirmed eternal security. At first, he taught the freedom of the will in his uh, early Christianity, but in his uh, later Christianity, he began to deny free will. Augustine was a a Manichaean agnostic for about nine, ten years of his life before he became a professing Christian and ended up becoming the top theologian of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, in the early fifth century, a British monk named Pelagius criticized a statement that Augustine had made in his confessions. Augustine had declared to God, grant what you command and command what you desire. Well, this made it appear that everything in our obedience comes from God and nothing comes from man. And rather than admitting that he had overstated things in his confessions, he swung 180 degrees in the opposite direction of the historic faith and declared that man can do absolutely nothing toward his own salvation. He said that every bit of our salvation comes from God, from our initial faith, our obedience, and our enduring to the end. Augustine swung the pendulum in the opposite direction, more, you know, more in the direction of his Manichaean Gnosticism, which had a view that there were the elect among the Manichaeans, and the elect, you know, they were, once they were saved, they were always saved. They would persevere uh, in the Manichaean faith, which was not Christian at all. This resurrection of Gnostic teaching by Augustine should have sent shockwaves throughout the church. But Augustine wrote in Latin, and so much of what he said was never read by the Greek-speaking Eastern Christians, and they never adopted his theology. His impact might have been much less if there hadn't been much later an Augustinian monk named Martin Luther. In the Reformation of the 16th century, You have Luther, who believes, just like the fathers on this, he believes that it is possible to commit apostasy. He actually comes against the teaching of once saved, always saved, but he did believe that there were certain people that were given the special gift, uh, who were the elect, who would be given the gift of perseverance. His view of perseverance seems to be the same as Augustine, that we can never be sure in this life that we will be given the gift of perseverance until the day of our death. For Luther, there was the warning of final damnation for those who fell away and walked away from the faith. So it's really amazing. You have the once saved, always saved doctrine repudiated by the early church. You know, the first three centuries of church history. Uh, you have Augustine picking it up from the Gnostics and bringing it into the church, but only teaching that uh, the elect among saved people uh, will persevere and no one knows who they are. And then you have it going to John Calvin. I think Calvin is the one who takes it even further. Um, like, I guess that's why we call it Calvinism, not Lutheranism. Once saved, always saved, as we know it today, actually stems back to John Calvin and his followers. He wrote his work of systematic theology entitled Institutes of the Christian Religion, which is largely built on Augustine's teachings. He says that his whole theology could be uh, systemized through by just quoting Augustine's teaching. The main difference between Calvin and Augustine is that although Augustine emphasized that we cannot know for certain until the day of our death that we are of the elect, 
Calvin emphasized that there are clear indications in this life. But it was Calvin who basically took that last idea that, you know, the elector gave him the gift of perseverance and said that all Christians, anyone who comes to Christ and receives him, uh, has the gift of perseverance and will be finally and, and irrevocably and inevitably saved. So Calvin diverged from the tradition that came before him. He even diverged from what other Reformation leaders taught. But then after him, the Baptists, most of them, I'm free will Baptist, but most of the Baptists diverge with him from the Christian tradition. The Reformed Presbyterian tradition diverges with Calvin from the mainstream Christian tradition. But then when you look at the rest of Christianity today, they don't believe in once saved, always saved, or the certain perseverance of the saints. The majority of Christians uh, in America or elsewhere don't affirm the idea of eternal security. That's just not part of their DNA. The whole Methodist denomination, I mean, the second largest Protestant denomination in America is the United Methodist Church. You have the Restoration Movement, like Christian churches, Church of Christ, they're not Calvinist. The Anabaptist movement almost uh, uniformly believes that it's possible for a true believer to uh, apostatize from the faith. It would be an odd thing to accuse uh, Lutherans even, or Episcopalians of being Calvinists. So the vast majority of Christians uh, do not believe in once saved, always saved. This has never meant total perfection or sinlessness. It has always meant faithfulness. The possibility of sin exists until Christ comes and we are transformed into his image. 1 John 2, 1 is the answer to that. If anyone sins, it immediately says there is a possibility that you'll sin, but then you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. If you sin, you can go before the throne of grace boldly. It's a difference between falling in dirt and rolling in dirt. I've stumbled in the 30 years I've walked with God, but the Spirit of God had me to get up and get up quick. If I slip up, I'm careless perhaps sometime, I immediately my conscience convicts me. I say, Lord, please forgive me. But I take that sin more seriously because I don't want to hurt my Lord. Recognizing that believers will fail as the followers of Jesus failed in the Gospels themselves is a crucial understanding of the Christian life. We will have some good days and some bad days, but the pattern of our life over time is faithfulness and a steady growth. Do you expect your child to remain the same level physically, intellectually, in every way, always doing the same foolish things? We want our child to grow. You'd be disappointed if your child is not growing emotionally, intellectually, physically, in every way. This is how the Christian life is, from glory to glory. That is God's will for us. Did you know that there are over 80 passages in the New Testament that warn Christians not to lose what they've got in Christ. Eighty. And most of them are ignored or overlooked or not preached about, but they're serious. In his book, Major Bible Themes, Lewis Sperry Schaefer, a strong advocate of once saved, always saved, he makes this statement. As many as 85 passages are listed by those holding the Arminian view as establishing the doctrine of conditional security. So he acknowledges the great weight of Scripture behind conditional security. We have warning passages in James and Peter and John. It's very difficult to think of any New Testament document that doesn't refute once saved, always saved. In 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, I think you have one of the clearest passages in all the entire Bible that uh, you could forfeit your salvation because nobody's going to doubt the Apostle Paul saved. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable one. So I do not run aimlessly. I don't box as one beating the air. I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Disqualified, put out of the race. Not a question of coming in second or third. Disqualified. 
It's amazing because he uses that word adakamas elsewhere when talking to the Corinthians or writing to the Corinthians. And he states in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he warns in verse 21 of those who have not yet repented of their, their sexual immorality, their, their sin and so forth. And he warns them that they must, you know, examine themselves. In chapter 13, verse 5, he says, examine yourselves, uh, test yourselves to see whether or not you're in the faith, unless you are adakamas. He used the same exact Greek word. He defines adakamas as being without Christ, as not being in the faith anymore. Now, he's the great apostle Paul who's been taken up to the third heaven and planted churches, written scripture. What does he say about himself? If ever there was a person who des deserved to go to heaven because he served the Lord, it's Paul. But he says, I discipline my body, verse 27. If Paul lives with the feeling that it could be distantly possible that I would be put out of this race. How can we say, no, you can't be put out of the race, no matter what you do. And then he goes on to say, I'll give you some examples. Ignore the chapter division. In chapter 10, he says, remember the people who came out of Egypt, baptized into Moses in the Red Sea and all that? Nevertheless, verse 5, with most of them, God was not well pleased and they were perished in the wilderness. He's connecting to that with what he just said, that I could be disqualified. And verse 11, these things are happened to them as an example and were written for our instruction. Here's the important thing. The one who thinks he stands, let him be careful, lest he does not fall. Behold then the kindness and severity of God. To those who fell, severity, but to you, God's kindness, if you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. In Romans chapter 11, Paul makes very clear declarations that you can absolutely forfeit your salvation. Paul is giving a, a warning to believers that just as uh, Israel, we see, was, was cut off and the Gentiles were, were grafted in, it says we should not have any uh, reason to be boastful because says we could also be cut off. But let me tell you, he says, you're only going to continue to be grafted in if you continue to trust, if you continue to live in his goodness. If you don't, you'll be cut off just like they were. I don't see how you could state it any more clearly. Look carefully at the kindness and the severity of God. To those who fell, severity. He's talking about the Jewish people. But to you, kindness if, there's a big if, if you continue in his kindness. Why does the Bible use the word if? It should, if it's once saved, always saved, it should say, you know, when. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. It's a, it's a guaranteed thing. He says, don't be high-minded or conceited, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. The problem uh, for the once saved, always saved crowd with this verse is that they say it's impossible to fall away. And if it's impossible to, to fall away, then... Uh, there's no reason to fear at all. Some once saved, always saved people are saying, well, Paul's just kind of warning the Gentiles corporately. He's just warning Gentiles that they need to recognize the Jewish position and so forth. Uh, they're trying to divert you. I'm sorry. Look at what the text actually says. He's not talking to Gentiles generally. He's warning those who stand by their faith. You don't tell somebody at your work that, or, or a neighbor that doesn't know Jesus, that they stand in Christ by their faith and they need to keep the faith or be cut off. That makes no sense at all. You've been grafted into this one wonderful olive tree. But if you are not faithful, we'll cut you off as well. So faithfulness is a requirement. And I encourage that the, anybody who's listening to this, look at what the text says. Quit trying to explain it away in view of a theology that you want to uphold. Uphold the word of God and change your theology. Hebrews has uh, at least a dozen passages that refute once saved, always saved. Chapter 6 and 10 seem to just say bluntly, you can lose your salvation. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Hebrews 6 is another, I believe, just categorically clear passage uh, that teaches that people can once be saved and actually forfeit salvation. There are three popular responses by proponents of eternal security to the warning passages. The first is, these are not true believers that are being addressed. The second is, 
these texts are not talking about the loss of salvation. They're talking about the loss of rewards. The third is God is using these warnings to get believers to persevere, even though he knows they cannot help but persevere. The book of Hebrews is very clearly written to Christians. That's that's clear on every single page of the book of Hebrews. It's very difficult to say that one who has been enlightened and tasted the heavenly gift and made a partaker of the Holy Spirit and has been sanctified by the blood of Christ and is a brother, it's hard to say that those people have never been genuinely converted. I don't think there's any way around this being an apostasy text, because even though the word is tasted is used, it means really experienced. I mean, it says in the same book that Christ tasted death. Well, that doesn't mean he had a little bit of taste of death. It means he died. When it says they received the Holy Spirit, the Greek word that is used there is the same word that's used in Hebrews 3, 1 of holy brethren who had received the heavenly calling. Did they receive the heavenly calling or not? You know, Hebrews 6, 4 had been enlightened tasted of the heavenly gift that's definitely born again and made partakers of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said the world can't receive the Holy Spirit. Paul said the natural man doesn't receive the things of the Holy Spirit. Yet these folks had received the Holy Spirit. It says it's impossible to renew them again to repentance. Again to repentance? Again means they had repented initially. Even to right to the end in Hebrews 13, where he talks about the regular practice of the Christian faith that they are doing in Rome. So, no, he's not writing to non-Christians. Verse 6, having fallen away, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. The idea that we could be beyond retrieval reminds us of Proverbs 29. Someone can be rebuked and uh, stiff-necked. After so many rebukes, he can get to the point where he's broken beyond the possibility of change. That's a scary passage. Every day that you uh, sin is a day that you are getting closer and closer to that point of reprobation. You can't keep on living in a way that hurts him, that crucifies him again. You can't do that. Think about it this way. Every sin is a sin for which Jesus had to die. How could you ever take a laissez-faire view of your sin once you knew that? You helped crucify Christ. And that's why in Hebrews we hear about the apostate re-crucifying Christ by the sins that they were committing of rejecting and turning away from Christ. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? The author of Hebrews, who is certainly saved, includes himself in the warning. He says, for if we uh, go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. He talks about how they've trampled underfoot the blood of Christ by which they were sanctified. And, you know, some say, well, they were sanctified. They just kind of went to church. Well, no, the, the book of Hebrews, and especially chapter 10, even earlier, uses sanctification in the context of salvation. And also it's in the passive voice. It's not something they did. God sanctified them by the blood of Christ. Some proponents of eternal security say that God is just using the warning passages as a means of perseverance, a means to get people to persevere, even though he knows that he's going to make them persevere. Well, the problem with that is that that's not quite honest. If I am a teacher and I have already decided in advance that all my students are going to pass the course, and if I say you must study or else you will make an F in this course, that is disingenuous. If they were predetermined not to be saved from before the foundation of the universe, then there's no point in warning them about apostasy because they couldn't do otherwise. No, these are real warnings to real Christians because there really is real spiritual danger for them. And he says, if people disobeyed the law of Moses, died without mercy, without with two or three witnesses bearing witness to them, how much severer the punishment will be for those who have trampled underfoot the Son of God and treated the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified as unclean and has insulted 
the Holy Spirit. It's an a fortiori argument. If the Old Testament people of God could lose their salvation, given the greater privilege we have in the gospel, how much more severely would God deal with us? You get this greater to lesser again, which we've been seeing over and over again throughout uh, the warnings in the New Testament, that we're not to say, well, we're not under the law, so therefore we can commit apostasy. Over and over again in Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 12, it's even worse to fall away under grace. So this text rules out the loss of rewards view because it says that the one who turns from Christ can only expect a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. That is not the loss of rewards. Verses like this would put the fear of God into my heart, even as a Christian, uh, that I have a, an obligation and a, and a responsibility towards God as a Christian. There comes a time when the heart can be hardened, the heart becomes unwarmable, and the will becomes unwilling because of a persistent pattern of sin that allows us to drift away from the dock of Christ in his salvation. Most Arminians believe that sin can directly cause apostasy. However, reformed Arminians like myself believe that sin hardens your heart. It doesn't lead directly to apostasy, but it can lead to a hardening of the heart whereby you harden your heart against the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Then that union with Christ that comes by faith alone can be broken and you can commit apostasy. And that when you do that, it's irremediable. I tend to believe that those who are worried about whether they have committed the sin of apostasy are safe. Well, who is it saying it's impossible to renew again in repentance? Not everybody that falls away. The scriptures are very clear that branches were broken off. Romans 11 can be grafted back in again. James chapter 5, that if you bring one who has turned from the truth back, you'll save a soul from death and hide a multitude of sins. The prodigal son came back and he was lost, but now he's found. He was dead, but now he's alive. That's all over the scripture. I think the ISV brings it out really, really well uh, because it brings out the present tense participle so long as they continue to crucify the Son of God afresh. If people are hell bent on hell and rejecting Jesus, yeah, the author of Hebrews warns you can harden your heart so much in chapter three where you can fall away from the living God and you don't hear his voice. But that doesn't mean his voice wasn't there. It is there, but it's you tuning out his voice. If we find in ourselves a numb heart, a cold heart, a desire not to obey, we should take heed to these warning passages and turn our hearts toward God until we hear the voice of God again. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2. Here again is a strong statement about the possibility of a believer being lost. For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. It says the way of righteousness. What's the way of righteousness? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The early church was called the way. These are people who left the faith. If after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge, and we're not talking about intellectual knowledge, we're talking about intimate personal knowledge. And the Greek word he uses there is epigenosis. Uh, that's experiential knowledge. Many Calvinists will admit, and when they're commenting on Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it uh, has to do with salvation knowledge. Then after knowing it, to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What is that but a person who has truly known salvation? The message of the true proverb has happened to them. A dog returns to its vomit. A sow, after washing, returns to wallowing in the mire. The Calvinist interpretation would be that if you've truly been washed, you could never go back to the mire. You could never go back to the mud, which itself seems to raise the question, well, why does Peter warn them? Peter is illustrating the lapsed state of a former believer, which he warns about in chapter 1, when he describes believers as having escaped the corruptions of the world through lust and forgetting that they were cleansed from their past sins. The pig is representative of a believer who has been cleansed and forgets he was even washed and goes back to the mud. I mean, I find it incredible that anyone could still teach 
once saved, always saved, in light of that passage, which simply repeats what is said over and over in the New Testament. This is a passage for Christians. It was understood that way in the early church. And this is consistent with Jesus' teaching in the Gospels and the apostolic teaching in the whole New Testament. James is yet another incredibly clear passage about forfeiture of salvation, a strong warning. And James in chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, he says, Brethren, he's talking to brethren, genuine believers. And he says, Brethren, if any of you turn from the truth, in other words, they're in the truth, and one converts him back, he'll save a soul from death and hide a multitude of sins. They'll say, well, it's just talking about him, not really a soul. Uh, but you know what? That, that word suke is used one other time in the book of James in relationship to the truth and salvation. And that's where James says to receive the word in gratitude which is able to save your souls, your suke. So we're talking about spiritual salvation here, which can be lost, as James points out. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. Uh, many try to take that text and try to get out of it by saying, you know, Jesus right there is talking about enduring to the end of the tribulation. If you live through the whole tribulation, then your body will be saved. That's not the context. The context there is on the heels when Jesus makes this declaration. It's on the heels of Jesus' warning in verses 9, 10, 11, and 12 that many will fall away from the faith and they'll be seduced by false Christ and, and false prophets. Many false prophets will arise and mislead many people and lawlessness or sin is going to increase and the love of many of Jesus' disciples will become cold, cold towards the Lord and warm towards the world. But the one who endures to the end, in the context it means the one who endures in love for Jesus Christ fervently until the end will be saved. Does it mean those who don't endure to the end will also be saved? <laughs> then we are going against the words of Jesus Christ. A similar passage is Matthew 10, 22, where Jesus says, And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. Here Jesus is talking to believing disciples, people who have already been saved, and he's alerting us to the persecution and trials we will face as his disciples. Yet he warns us we must endure faithfully to the end, in order to be saved. In that same uh, teaching of Jesus, he says, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before the Father who is in heaven. He says, don't fear men who could destroy your body, but fear God who could destroy your body and soul in hell. So Jesus is giving us salvific warnings here. And I think it's very important that we understand that. Revelation 3, 5. If you overcome, you'll be clothed in white garments. I will not erase your name from the book of life. Now, just look at this possibility that your name can be erased from the book of life. Yes, you're Christians now, but if you do this, this, and this in terms of belief and behavior, well, your name can be erased from the Lamb's book of eternal life. They say, oh, my name's in the book of life. It'll be there forever. Well, is Jesus telling a lie here? Is he making an empty threat? If you overcome, your name will never be erased from the book of life. What if you don't overcome? Now, it's interesting that some people seek to wiggle out of this solemn warning, and they imagine that the book of life is made up of everybody who's ever lived. However, we know from Revelation chapter 17, verse 8, that the names of the lost were never written in the book of life, and the warning, therefore, could only apply to apostate former believers. It says in verse 6, He who has a year to hear, he who is willing to listen to the truth and face up to the facts, let him hear In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. In Greek, seal is often, you know, a stamp, a seal of approval, a seal that a king puts on something that it belongs to him. Uh, and seals can be broken, stamps can be effaced. Everybody in Paul's world knew seals could be broken. There were seals on amphoras, wine jars. There were seals on documents. The same thing for the word earnest, which unfortunately is sometimes translated as guarantee. Well, guarantee. <laughs> Obviously, you have been guaranteed your salvation by the Holy Spirit, and that's the end of it. You're going to be saved. Well, 
Translation is a tricky business. <laughs> Even the word guarantee has more than one signification. But the word earnest is like earnest money. It means a down payment. If you think what God's done in your life so far is great, you ain't seen nothing yet. The Holy Spirit is just the, if you will, first installment of God's work in your life and where this is all going. Paul's wonderful statement about the Holy Spirit as a seal, as a down payment, allows us to make a distinction between assurance and eternal security. About four times, the Apostle Paul speaks of the Holy Spirit as the proof that we are saved. What is the evidence that you are a Christian? The work of the Holy Spirit in your life, changing your affections, changing your desires, making you able to live the life of Christ in ways that were simply never possible before the cross. We have powerful assurance for the internal working of the Holy Spirit. We don't need some kind of eternal security. We simply need reassurance. He is not saying you can live any way you want in the meantime because you've been sealed. That would never be consistent with the teachings of Paul. Paul goes on to warn, warn the church of Ephesus that if they practice immorality and wicked sins. He gives a vice list. He says, no, for certain, don't let anyone deceive you, he says, because a lot of people are deceiving people on this. Let no one deceive you by vain words because of these things you will not inherit the kingdom of Christ. The same thing you have in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 about being sealed by the Holy Spirit, you have in Ephesians 4, 30. But in Ephesians 4.30, it also says, not only are you sealed by the Spirit, but that you can grieve the Holy Spirit. So we've been sealed in the day of salvation, but then he warns us not to grieve the Holy Spirit. And Paul is uh, taking a reference there from Isaiah chapter 63, verse 10, when they were going into the promised land, but they grieved God's Holy Spirit and they became his enemies and he wiped many of them out. And so we have to be very clear that you can do despite to the Spirit, like it says in Hebrews 10. If we grieve the Holy Spirit, that's uh, grieving away the means of our salvation. If the Spirit troubles you this morning, thank God He's troubling you before you go to hell. The Spirit will leave you. Well, this is what you can do with the Holy Spirit. Accept Him, resist Him, grieve Him, quench Him. Another verse that you often hear from the once saved, always saved camp is uh, John 10, 27 to 28. He says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And so they will say, uh, you know, you are once saved, always saved um, as, a, as a Christian because he gives you eternal life and you'll never perish. John 10 is an incredibly beautiful passage. Uh, it has to do with our security in Christ that no one can snatch us out. The Greek word's harpazo. Nobody can by force take us from his hand or the Father's hand. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. But you can jump out of the Father's hand if you like. Because the sheep there are defined as those who follow Christ. The Greek present tense is used. They follow and continue to follow Christ. They believe in him. It's the Greek present tense. Again, they believe and continue to believe in him. In John 10, you have all these present indicative verbs. My sheep are hearing my voice. They are following me. The condition in this verse is when he says, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And so if you're no longer following Christ, if you're no longer following his voice, then you no longer have the promises of this verse. They follow me and I give them eternal life. What if you don't follow? Is that promise still going to be fulfilled? They don't follow me and I still give them eternal life? The problem is when people want to take the promises of the Bible without taking the conditions of the Bible. It's all one sentence. You can't reject the first part and say he just gives us eternal life. And these people who follow me, hear my voice and follow me, will never perish. The scriptures are very clear that a sheep can harden his heart. In fact, Jesus addresses the sheep in Luke 12. He says, little flock. He's addressing the flock of sheep. And he warns them that they're to be like the good and faithful servant who gives out meat in due season. But he says, if that servant, that same servant, that same sheep in the flock uh, goes and beats the maidservants and gets drunk with the drunkards, that they'll be cut in pieces and thrown with the unbelievers, Jesus says in Luke 12. Well, Revelation 21, 8, it says the unbelievers go to the lake of fire. That's a bad deal. So the scriptures warn that you can harden your heart as a sheep and no longer hear his voice.
But I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? The early church understood it properly. Uh, the early church for the first few centuries of church history understood that the Apostle Paul was speaking of uh, himself before he was saved. In fact, it wasn't until uh, Augustine brought in the church the idea that Paul's talking about himself as a, as a saved person. And he just, you know, he's living an immoral life. He, he Things he wants to do, he can't do. And uh, things he doesn't want to do, he ends up doing. And he's a slave to sin. Well, is that really what Paul sounds like throughout the entire rest of the New Testament? Absolutely not. There is nothing in any of Paul's other letters that sound even remotely like Romans 7 as a paradigm or even a common experience in the Christian life. For this reason alone, we ought to be very wary of those who think that Romans 7 is describing a typical struggle for a typical Christian as they try to work out the Christian life. I personally grieve when I hear a noted Christian preacher say that Romans 7 describes the normal Christian life. That Yes, we love Jesus, but we're unable to resist sin. Thankfully, there are certain Calvinists uh, that do disagree with that viewpoint. Uh, Douglas Moo, for instance, uh, Hoekema, other Calvinists say, no, Paul's definitely contextually in a lost state there before he found Christ. One of the great disasters in the church is separating chapter 6, 7, and 8. They must be read together. After Paul cries out to Jesus and says, and at the end of Romans 7, you know, who will save me from this body of death? But when you go to chapter 8, Jesus is the one that gives him deliverance. Chapter 8 provides an amazing, glorious victory of the Christian over these kinds of temptations. They receive, like Jesus did, the Holy Spirit to attend their ways and to empower them to do what God calls them to do in this life. We read in Romans chapter 8, the first few verses, that the law of life and spirit gave him victory over the law of sin and death. Now he's under the new covenant. He's not in the Romans 7 state anymore. So, is it possible for us to defeat sin? For me, no. But the Holy Spirit in me can. And so those injunctions that Paul gives so strongly in Romans 6 are possible, but they're possible in the light of Romans 8. Chapter 7 seems to be a digression where Paul is talking about the experience of trying to live a victorious Christian life in the power of following the law of Moses. So Romans 7, unfortunately, has been used as a, as a license for many people. It breaks my heart because there are countless Christians quoting Romans 7 as they're living wicked lives. But Paul says, if you live this way, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Calvinists actually call this the golden chain that, you know, those who are called, you know, and so forth, all the way to glorification. I agree with John Wesley, who stated that uh, Paul's not saying that everybody that was called is justified, that everybody that's justified ends up being glorified. He's just showing how God works in salvation. Paul does not affirm, either here or in any other part of his writings, that precisely the same number of men are called, justified, and glorified. He does not deny that a believer may fall away and be cut off between his special calling and his glorification. Romans 11.22 He only affirms that this is the method whereby God leads us step by step toward heaven. Even when you look at the so-called steps and these links in this golden chain, not any one step guarantees the next step. The Bible says many are called, but few are chosen. So just being called doesn't mean you're going to automatically be chosen. Peter says in 2 Peter 1.10, to make your calling an election, which is you're being chosen, make it sure, ratify it. And the context there is continuing in the faith. So that doesn't guarantee that you'll, you'll be justified. And those who are justified, they can't say, well, I'm for sure going to be glorified uh, automatically. Scriptures say in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38 and 39, the just shall live by faith. But if he draws back, 
He's not going forward in that chain, now he's going backwards. My soul will have no pleasure in him. There's one thing in that list that's, that's missing from that list. That would be you. What Paul is saying is no external circumstance or external person, not even a demon, not even an angel. Advocates of once saved, always saved, propound this verse as though Paul followed his question with the words, shall adultery or murder or theft or fornication or covetousness or lying? In other words, no matter what our sins may be, they will not separate us from God's love. Yet that's not what Paul said. He followed his question with these words, shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. Now those are not sins. Those are things that Paul and his other faithful Christians were suffering. It's a serious travesty in the church right now that the most popular message ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount, has in many churches fallen by the wayside because it's considered legalistic. Many people have difficulty with the Sermon on the Mount. They will look at what Jesus is saying there and they will say, well, that's impossible. Moses said, you know, to, uh, uh, you know, you should not murder. But Jesus said, if you, if you hate someone in your heart, then you commit murder in your heart. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, if once saved, always saved is true, then th that statement is false. For it would mean that we will be admitted to heaven even if we haven't forgiven others their trespasses. Jesus gives teaching about divorce and remarriage there. He gives teaching about living a holy life. He gives teaching about not following an adultery and how serious that is. Passages that totally warn against the idea of once saved, always saved. So a lot of people don't like the Sermon on the Mount and they say, no, it's not really for the church. And they will then say, and the proof of that is in Matthew 5, 48, when Jesus says, you must be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Well, obviously, <laughs> none of us can be as perfect as God. So obviously, Jesus doesn't intend for us to live in those ways. We hear this, be perfect as even your heavenly Father is perfect. But what is he talking about? About. I like to say a text without a context is just a pretext for whatever you want it to mean. Matthew 5 does not end with be perfect as a summary of Matthew 5, 17 through 48, but as a crystallization of the love of God for all people visible in the sun and the rain falling upon all people. He does not only love those who love him. He does not only love those who love him back. His love is perfect. It is complete. And that's the sense of the Greek word there. Teleos means perfect or mature or complete. Those are the three basic meanings of that word. When Paul uses language like this, for example, in Philippians, he's actually using some another point on the spectrum of words of what telos can mean. Namely, he's talking about growing up, becoming mature in Christ. So the word doesn't just have one meaning, i.e. perfection. It has a spectrum of meanings ranging from goal, completion, perfection, maturity. And the idea of our righteousness surpassing that of the Pharisees, well, that, that just can't be done. But this ignores the interactions Jesus has with the Pharisees. The Pharisees were disciples of Moses. They followed the law of Moses. But on the inside, Jesus said they weren't cleansed, that they appeared righteous on the outside, but inwardly they were filthy. And so Christianity is about that inward purity. The righteousness of the Pharisees was not something uh, that was, wow, unattainable. It, it was below the minimum accepted standard. <laughs> the disciples were supposed to preach the gospel to all the nations and to teach them to observe everything that he commanded the disciples to follow, which would be the Sermon on the Mount. And that's how we're supposed to be discipling people. We cannot dare jettison Jesus' teaching and claim to be New Testament Christians. When the Sermon on the Mount ends, Jesus gives a little story that we sang as children, that the wise man built his house upon a rock it was actually a very serious story by Jesus, an image to say at the end 
that the wise person is the one who hears these words of mine and does them. It is absolutely disastrous to read the Sermon on the Mount as if Jesus is saying, this is the intense righteousness that God wants and you'll never fulfill it. No, that is not at all what Jesus does. It is for people who are already disciples and Jesus says to them, this is what following me looks like in the kingdom of God. We are to be holy. We're to strive for that, that quality which sets us apart from the world. And that is not an option. If we're not going to do that, we're not going to make it. This is what Jesus is teaching. So the Sermon on the Mount is discipleship for those who want to follow Jesus into the kingdom of God. All your past sins are forgiven when you're first saved but your future sins are not pre-forgiven. In other words, you start with a clean slate, but you can muddy that slate again. Uh, we know that we're forgiven our past sins, not our future sins, because in 2 Peter chapter 1, it warns about those who forget that they were cleansed from their past sins. That's why we read in James chapter 5, verse 19 and 20, when the brother who is brought back after he falls away from the Lord, it says you'll save a soul from death and hide a multitude of sins. That's why we're told that we're to confess our sins and then he's faithful and just forgive us our sins. If people say their future sins are also forgiven, like some people do preach, then 1 John 2, 1, 1 John 1, 9 is meaningless. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. I'll say, Lord, I have to confess nothing. They're already forgiven. There's too many scriptures that are over throughout the New Testament. It's what the early church taught as well. You must continue to confess your sins. Now, if we die and there's one sin unconfessed, well, guess what? We're branches in the vine. Uh, falling short of the Lord's glory doesn't sever us from the vine. It's apostasy that severs us from the vine. Uh, that's a continual rebellion against God. So the idea that your future sins are forgiven would imply that your, your sins are forgiven apart from repentance. Now, if you sin in the future, there is forgiveness for those sins if you repent. And what sin in the life of the Christian can do without repentance is get in the way of receiving the ongoing forgiveness that Christ has already provided. That's the way to look at it. Our sins are taken care of at the cross by Jesus Christ. Our subjective experience of forgiveness and reconciliation with God is an ongoing relationship with God that we conduct in confession, admission, repentance, and restitution. I think there's a real false dilemma between you either believe in once saved, always saved, or you believe that you're saved by your works. There is no righteous act that I can commit that would give me status with God. There's nothing I can do that would save me from the condemnation of my sins. We are saved by faith. What does give us standing with God? The blood of Christ. Nothing else but the blood of Christ gives us standing with him. Justification is by faith. That means a person is declared righteous by God on the basis of Christ's sacrifice, of what Christ has done for us. So it's not about getting something the old-fashioned way by earning it. It never was. Salvation is by grace and through faith. But those who are saved because of the grace of God, are transformed into agents of good works in this world. Obviously, good works are part of the process of being sanctified. In fact, Ephesians says that we were created in Christ Jesus for good works. If we're justified by faith, which is a living faith that results in works, it's not works that justifies us. Uh, works are just the evidence of living faith. And as long as we are in the faith and we have the faith, then we have the promises of faith, like eternal life and the forgiveness of sin. Well, salvation has three tenses. I have been saved, I am being saved, I shall be saved. And until you get through all three tenses, the situation is not resolved. Justification by faith does not mean that there is a locked door behind us. Justification means that people have been launched into the kingdom of God and they are now called to follow Jesus. If they choose to walk away from Jesus, it is because their faith 
has collapsed, that they've chosen to walk away. Those who are in Christ, filled by the Spirit, do what the law wanted them to do, and even more. So no, no, good works do not save us. On the other hand, salvation that does not issue in a transformed life has missed the whole point. The promises of the new covenant in Jeremiah and in Ezekiel is that something new is going to occur. And that something new is at times expressed as a dynamic presence of God's spirit. Jeremiah says, God's going to give you a new covenant, but it's going to be a new covenant because I'm going to take it from the stone out there to the heart here. It's new in its location. It's new that now somehow we will be able to do the things that God loves. The Old Testament could tell you what you ought to do, but it couldn't enable you to do it. He puts his law into my mind and writes it in my heart. Now, what does that mean? Putting it into my mind means he gives me a desire, but desire alone is not enough. I need ability as well. And so the Holy Spirit gives me power in my heart. So the Old Testament is asking that question. You want us to share your holy character, but we can't. Would you give us the Holy Spirit? Yes, but your temple is hopelessly corrupted. How are we going to cleanse the temple? The blood of my son. And now, your temple having been cleansed, I can give you my Holy Spirit. And you can walk like I walk. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Those words were not spoken to unbelievers, but to his disciples. A lot of New Testament scholars, if they're asked the question, does the fear of the Lord in the New Testament play any role in our salvation or sanctification, we would probably dismiss that out of hand and say, no, of course not, you know. Uh, yet they're missing a whole lot of scriptures. We're told to perfect holiness, which is sanctification and the fear of God. Author of Hebrews in chapter 4, verse 1 says, let us fear lest we fail to enter the rest. I meet people all the time tell me they don't fear God. I'm afraid for someone that says that. Believing in conditional security helped me stay on the straight and narrow. It helped me uh, keep a, a, a conscience that was sensitive to the convictions of the Holy Spirit. This once saved, always saved doctrine just uh, destroys the fear of God. I see so many Christians who are frustrated because they're trying to live God's way and have their own way at the same time. It won't work. People are taught that once you're saved, you can rebel against God and you can live like hell and still enter the kingdom of heaven. That is a lie from the pit of hell. I've got to tell the truth. And if we do not get serious about it, many of us, we are going to perish because we want to believe a lie and we will heap unto ourselves these false teachers that will itch your ear. We're not debtors to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, crucify or put to death the deeds of the flesh, you shall live. That's a warning, but also a promise that you can have victory over the flesh. Read the early church fathers. These guys were being martyred for the faith and not giving in and were walking and living holy lives, you know? And it's really clear in scripture that we can live a victorious life. In fact, we're expected to as believers. A holy life is very possible. Jesus said, or the Bible says, he never allows you to be tempted above what you're able to bear. He always provides a way of escape. Take seriously the warning to flee sin or resist the devil or don't quench the work of the Spirit in your life. He said to be my disciples, you must pick 
take up your cross and deny yourself. In other words, you can't be swept away by dopamine. Put your feet down and say, what am I doing? I'm not going to let people leave me to hell. I'm living a wicked life that I refuse to repent of because they told me I can't have victory. You can have victory. The victory is in the power of the Holy Spirit through the Lord Jesus Christ who will give you power to live a holy life. Walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Simply seek the Father and walk in the Spirit and you will have victory. What happens is that as that happens, as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and self-control happens in your life, well then, increasingly, you don't want to sin. So we always fall short of God's glory. But it's one thing to say, you know what? I'm not perfectly like Jesus yet. It grieves my heart. Help me to be more loving and, and more like Christ. It's another thing to be living a life in rebellion to God, purposely committing adultery and drunkenness and theft and lying and hating on people and and not really repenting, but saying, hey, I'm sorry, Lord, but continue to, to walk down that road. That's not true repentance. Jesus preached repentance. He preached, repent, change your mind, change your life. If you don't change your mind, you can't change your life. God is calling us to change our mind. And repent is mean, means a turning about. It's like the military term on the parade ground when you say about turn. They turn 180 degrees and face the other way. Repentance is turning to Jesus Christ in faith, a change of heart, a change of mind, which leads to a change of lifestyle. The word metanoia, repentance, means a, an actual turning away. It doesn't have to do with how you feel about it. I mean, you might feel guilty or you might not feel guilty. It depends on how anesthetized your conscience is. It is no longer running down that broad road that leads to destruction that Jesus said many people are on, but it's having a change of heart and a change of mind whereby I turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, who's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the narrow road. In light of all this discussion about once saved, always saved, and the genuine possibility of apostasy leading to dire consequences and eternal judgment, I believe that we should fall on our knees before God for His grace. Genesis to Revelation, bottom line, God hates sin, but He has given us free will, and there will always be consequences either way we choose. At the end of the day, it's no one's fault but our own if we miss heaven. No one has an excuse because they will not give diligence to what is already written.